Okay, we're on. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so, I am absolutely thrilled to see the crowd today. Uh, welcome to HCC's first annual campus book event. This event is part of HCC's 75th anniversary proceedings. My name is Alicia Drumgill. I teach English here at HCC, and I'm also the co-chair of the campus book committee. Um, I just like to take a moment to recognize all of the wonderful people on our campus who have made this event possible today. So a lot of hands went into this, so thank you so much. This year's campus book, as you know, is This, I Believe, The Personal Philosophies of Remarkable Men and Women, Volume 1. In honor of this event, we have our keynote speaker, Ms. Selena Wilkes, here with us today. But first, the co-chair of this committee would like to say a few words to you. Um, if you'll please join me in welcoming Dr. James Clauber, the president of HCC. Thank you very much, Professor Drumgoole. It's good to uh, be with you all today. Welcome, everyone. This is exciting. I will tell you that uh, for the past four years that I've been here, we've been talking about wanting to do a, a campus-wide book or a common reading program, and I am thrilled that this is we are able to kind of bring this to fruition. This is our first year that we've done this, and to be able to do it in our 75th year of the college as we're celebrating our 75th anniversary makes it even more special. And uh, for those of you who um, are unaware of common reading programs and how they work, it, the idea is that we have a committee that selects a book and uh, we read it across our curriculum. We get teachers engaged in it, but that book is more than just the contents of those pages. The book really goes in, 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 in our future years as we move forward with this. It speaks to us. It teaches us you know, some important facet of life um, that, that we should embrace and recognize. So I'm really excited about the future of our uh, campus-wide uh, book selection, not only this year, but in future years. And I'm thrilled that we're able to have a, a famous local person come and uh, speak to us in Selena Wilkes. So with that, Professor Drummond, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you all for coming today. All right. Our speaker today is a pillar of the local community. Uh, many of us here already know or have met Selena Wilkes, and for those of you who have not met her yet, you're in for a treat. Selena has a long and distinguished athletic career. She attended Catawba College and was the class of 1996, where she was a member of the Sports Hall of Fame in 2009, as well as the Washington County, Maryland Sports Hall of Fame in 2006, right here in our county, and NCAA Division II South Atlantic Conference Sports Hall of Fame in 2005, a Ladies Professional Golf Association Future Tour playing member from 1997 to 2004. So um, she is also a graduate of Williamsport High School, class of 92. So any of you from Williamsport, she's an alumni. Uh, alumna. <laughs> um, and in addition to her athletic career, after traveling the country and retiring from tour golf in 2004, Selena continued her education, earning an MBA with specialization in human resources and organizational management from New York Institute of Technology. Since retiring from tour golf, Selena has had two successful cochlear implant surgery, and here's very well. She's previously lived in Florida and the Carolinas, but in the past eight years, she's returned to her roots and currently resides here in Williamsport, Maryland. She's an entrepreneur with several businesses, which she founded and currently serves as the CEO. She was named 2019 Washington County, Maryland BPW Business Professional of the Year. And she oversees currently Elmwood Farm Hospitality Group, Elmwood Farm B&B, Barn Wedding Event Venue, um, Elmwood Farm Soapworks Gift Shop, and Alpacas. If you've not been there, it's fantastic. Uh, as well as Mattress by Appointment Mattress Store, Port 44 Real Estate Development Group, and the Elmwood Farm Distillery is Selena's latest startup awaiting federal and state regulation to manufacture and bottle spirits along with a tasting room experience consisting of a variety of spirits to add to Elmwood Farm's hospitality portfolio and to support history, local tourism, as well as agritourism. 
Selena likewise serves on several boards and enjoys helping others while giving back to the community. In addition to spending quality time with her family and friends, she still plays golf occasionally for charity and stays active on her farm with her animals and her upcoming projects. Selena's story is quite inspiring as she has overcome such adversity since an early age through perseverance and forgiveness. Selena's strong faith, confidence, and leadership has guided her to overcome bullying and jealousy. In addition to motivational speaking, Selena has been featured in the Living Lutheran magazine. She is currently writing a book to inspire and encourage others through her life experiences, business leadership, and faith. Please join me in welcoming Selena Wilkes. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, <laughs> Professor Drumgool, thank you for those kind words. Also want to thank you to Dr. Clauber, Professor Drumgool, the rest of the campus book committee for inviting me today for this wonderful event, especially as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of Hagerstown Community College. You all are blessed to have this beautiful educational facility here. It's a great thing. Also, today is the first book event. So it's a pleasure to be here to be a part of that. Whether you realize it or not, you, you are an important part of your present and a future. Think this through for a minute. Just, just take a couple seconds to think this through. How are you going to make the best of your own future and utilize proven ways and creative new ideas to resolve challenges among people you don't even know? You meet new people every day. You are the next generation to get out of your comfort zone, to believe, to try, fail, and you will fail. Try again and again to persevere and make it all happen with a positive difference. I accepted this engagement today as a challenge to allow me to get out of my comfort zone as well. Now, why do I say that? Well, when I was given this book and I was asked about this event, I opened this book, this I believe, I'm looking at it, Oh my goodness, there's no pictures in this book. <laughs> I'm an athlete. I like to play ball. I want to look at pictures. It's just my style. But you know what? It's okay. I'm up for the challenge. So this, so I, uh, having been hearing impaired, I'm a very visual person. So I like to see and observe things. So I'm all about visualization. As a matter of fact, I was a first grade student, and I was that student that told her first grade teacher that I couldn't afford to buy a weekly reader to read with the rest of my class because my parents bought a $40,000 rocking chair. Where'd that come from? That's my imagination <laughs> and creativity. I do not want to read. Now, I understand many of you have written your essays, and uh, I find that very awesome because it got, out, got you out of your comfort zone to think creatively. And um, so I've dedicated myself to write my own essay as well in contribution to this wonderful event. Being the straightforward person that I am, this book consists of essays that may or may not align with everyone's thoughts or philosophies. However, that's the beauty of it. It allows you to get out of your comfort zone, to share, to help enrich your learning through critical thinking, interaction of others from diverse backgrounds, respecting other cultures and beliefs, and having exploration of personal values and beliefs. Now, I'm going to share with you my essay. My essay is titled, Faith, Forgive, and Freedom. Faith, Forgive, and Freedom. Realistically, you're a product of your parents by choice. Again, that is by choice, whether you want to follow or change the pattern for the better. 
positive and or negative experiences from one childhood, teenage or adult years, friendships with your career path can lead one to a specific philosophy of thoughts, attitudes, responsibilities, actions, and reasoning. By choice, faith, forgiveness, and freedom will lead you towards success. However, it's more importantly, one rather strives to be a person of value. People come from all walks of life, and everyone makes decisions, some good, some bad. Every single person can overcome and persevere to become a better person, as well as accomplishing new and greater milestones. Not only forgiving someone after they've asked for it, or after I feel like they've suffered enough to deserve it, but right in that moment when someone has done me wrong, forgiveness is theirs, because I do believe in the goodness of all people. I know that we are all capable of mistakes or bad things, myself included, but we all deserve another chance. Not just a second chance, but with a perpetual reset button where we can start over worry-free. There should never be a stigma attached to anyone because I do strongly believe that we can change when we're given the chance. Once you are given that chance, learn and grow from it as the same mistakes twice are not as acceptable nor tolerable. We always hear the words of one saying, I love you. People deserve to hear those words. They deserve a hug and feel good. On the other hand, I think there's no better feeling when someone says, I forgive you. When you hear those words, a weight is lifted from your shoulders. You feel free and whole, consciously and subconsciously. Due to my childhood experiences, forgiveness is a sense of freedom that I contribute to my faith. I am Lutheran, and I grew up in a family that did not attend church every Sunday. But we had strong faith and positive encouragement for one another. I did struggle with my faith in my earliest childhood years, but have developed a strong faith along my journey and truly take it to my heart. When the Lord tells us to love our enemies and do unto others as we would have undo to us, then that's how we should live. They call it the golden rule for a reason. Don't we all want forgiveness? Do we ever want to have to ask for it? There is no more agonizing moment in a person's life when they realize that they have done wrong. And we must have open and willing arms ready to embrace those people just as we would long to be embraced and forgiven. We shall not judge people by what you see on the outside. We are not in their shoes. We are not God. We don't know their hearts their upbringing, how they came about to make their decision, how they were influenced, and what control they really had over their actions. Not everyone has been given the same opportunity and blessing to be raised in a family that loved and supported them and taught them what is right. So we must always give the benefit of the doubt and be ready to give forgiveness to everyone. We all deserve it. We all need it. And in doing it, we will be happy, respectful, and kind to one another. Rediscover your faith. Please always forgive and live free. Now, what in the world made me think and say that for my essay? Allow me to share my unique journey of forgiveness with you. In recollection, 30 years ago, one spring evening in 1992, this is back when they had the mullets and the big hair. And the mullets are coming back, right? 
Okay. So back in 1992, this one spring evening, I actually received the True Grit Award for Winsport High School. Earning that achievement was the reward for the perseverance and hard work I did from three years old to 18 years old to make it all happen. I never looked back. Instead, I have continued to keep striving still to this day with all my business ventures, my farm, and my community relationships. I still have a lot left to do to make a positive difference. You know, most people have a perception of how tough they are or of all the unyielding roads they have taken. People believe that this aspect about them makes them tough and tenacious, ready to take on the world. In other words, grit is you prove your active desire and motivation to achieve your goals. You all, everybody in here has all demonstrated some ways to yourself, to your school, to your professors, to your coaches, teammates, family, and friends that your grit was the key to overcoming your very own personal challenges and reach your achievements, which makes it all worth it from the bottom of your heart. Of course, positive encouragement and support along the way is always greatly appreciated. Therefore, never forget where you came from and who helped you along the way. I can assure you my journey was not glamorous or easy. I really did not like school. You heard me. I did not like school. But I knew I had to figure it out. All I wanted to do was play ball. I was blessed with natural athletic talent. And playing sports made me feel good about myself. I knew I had to go to school to learn and earn a grade in order to continue to play ball. Not to mention, my wonderful and supportive parents were both teachers, but I couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> Their parents, they know everything, but they were wonderful to my upbringing. However, on the flip side, no matter what I did, I was always singled out as the deaf girl sitting up front beside that teacher and always called the teacher's pet. It was all by perception. Yes, I was deaf and wore two hearing aids to hear with amplification for sound and awareness. Due to my hearing loss, I was not a good reader, nor did I comprehend well. I did not speak or pronunciate well. My vocabulary was very limited. I would much rather draw pictures, look at pictures, and tell my own story. I lip read through all through school, and I still lip read to this day. I was the deaf volleyball setter who called the offensive plays. I was the four years softball fast pitcher who threw quite a few no hitters. I was the hearing impaired point guard who opponents would purposely yell at me when I'm at the foul line getting ready to take a foul shot, trying to make me miss it. And my teammates are like, would you shut up? She can't even hear you. But she's going to make it anyway. I was that student athlete who could read lips across the court, the field. I could see you talking in the back of the room. Coaches loved it. They could tell me the plays without saying it out loud so no one knew what was going on. On the other hand, I saw conversations being said, and sometimes about me, that I should not have ever known or have seen. That includes an elementary teacher who said she won't make it through high school. 
I was so defeated, humiliated, mad, angry. This was very difficult to deal with, tough to just ignore. It became very confusing at times. It created a lack of trust with everyone around me. Rather than being angry, hating everyone, and avoiding the world, I chose to make the best of every situation. It took constant forgiveness to move on with people who I was around every day. I learned to accept that people had no idea what I saw or what I knew. I learned to be kind, nice, and a fair friend to everyone. However, I always kept a safe distance to myself. I learned that being true and straightforward to myself and others was always safe ground. I realized I could turn all of this frustration into a positive situation for me and my future. The more people said no or didn't believe in me, the more motivated I became. I wanted to prove to myself that I can do it. I can do this. At the end of the day, this was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was. It was the best thing that ever happened. Just remember, when you're at the lowest point, never give up. Because the greatest moment is just right around the corner, waiting for you to conquer your next mission. What you can be. Now think about this, what you can be. Avoid letting anyone lease your space within your own head, unless they're a good tenant. In other words, be selective with who you let in your life and mind. Looking back on it, it is likely your best teacher was your last mistake. You are built from every mistake you ever made. We are not perfect human beings, nor do we have to pretend to be. But it's necessary for us to be the best version of ourselves and what we can be. Being the best version of yourself connects all of the dots in which your gifts, your circumstances, your purpose, your imperfections, and your journey, and your destiny all contribute to molding you. Simply embrace that. Simply embrace that. You don't always need a detailed plan, but rather be spontaneous at times when you just need to breathe. Trust, let go, and just see what happens. In all, myself included, I have never met a strong, happy, and successful person with an easy path. Doesn't happen. You can, you can right now, you can start where you are, use what you have, and do the absolutely best you can. Be thankful for what you do have. Jealousy is a very unattractive quality. As a matter of fact, it's ugly. Be thankful that, you, that the person who is better than you is on your team or that person is to motivate you to reach your fullest potential. Would you want to play against them? I was that pain in the butt teammate that everybody on the team was jealous about because no one wanted to compete and work with my work ethic. I can recall when my teammates asked me to slack off in practice, so they didn't have to work as hard. There's a lot of slackers in the world. Don't be one of those. What my teammates did not realize was I had no option, no other way. It was the only way I could survive and prove to myself and others that I can not only do this, but I can do it exceptionally well. Mediocre is not acceptable for me. 
like myself, I encourage you to do the same. When you make a commitment and do something, give it your all. Instead of positive example, and make a positive difference. Once you commit to it, go for it. Don't hold yourself back. In reality, I was so frustrated. This was a very dark time. I was very hurt inside. I wanted to quit school. I just wanted to move away and play ball. Didn't that sound awesome? <laughs> At one point, I even tried to convince my parents, my teachers, the parents, to sell the house and let's just move to Florida so that I can be on the golf course. Nobody around me is my happy spot. The golf course was peaceful, it's beautiful. It's just me and the trees and the scenery hitting the white golf ball. It was my way of seeking peace and relaxation. Of course, this idea of moving to Florida was not going to happen. It was not an option. All I was doing was running away from the problem. I was just running away from it. But instead, I came to realize having strong faith in learning to forgive others was the answer for me. I had to face the life challenges that will always be a part of my life and find the positive ways to succeed. So I continued my collegiate athletic career where I was an academic All-American for someone who didn't like school and became an All-American playing volleyball, basketball, and softball, carrying a full 18-hour course load every semester for four, for, for four years. And immediately after college, I went on to qualify for the LPGA Futures Tour for a professional golf career. For a deaf girl who wasn't going to graduate from high school, I say I won at the end. <laughs> when I graduated from college, I had a health and physical education degree. I could teach, or I can go on for my master's and be a grad assistant into coaching, or go for the opportunity to play golf at the professional level. I probably took the hardest road, but it's what I wanted. A lot of people doubted me and thought I was crazy. I knew I was capable. I had the talent, and I believed in myself. I packed my car, my golf bags, all my clothes, jammed it into my car. Could barely see out of the back window and went straight to Juno Beach, Florida. I did not know a soul, but I connected with a pastor at a Lutheran church ahead of my move, and he and his family kindly went out of their way to welcome me to stay with them short term and help me make contacts with some people in Florida in the golf community. This is where I got a job on a golf course so I can go after my dream of getting on a tour. For those you don't know, playing professional golf that life is pure grind. I have no regrets to this day. I did this opportunity at the right time in my life. I had nothing to lose. Two months later, I saved every penny to move on to my own studio apartment. I had a job at Palm Beach Polo and Country Club where I worked every day from sun up to 3 p.m. And right after that, I immediately went to work on my game with my golf swing coach and fitness trainer, and I would finish in dark. It was very grinding. That spring of March 97, I was ready to take my shot to qualify for the LPTA Futures Tour. I stepped on the course, and I did not know one single person on that golf course. My swing coach, my fitness trainer were not there. They stay back to work with their other students. Every golfer there knew each other from playing with or against each other in college, in junior golf, or the country clubs. Golfers were looking at me, giving me the eye, like, where did you come from? How, did, how come you didn't play golf with us in college? Hey, I had a different path. It was pretty unorthodox. 
I played all the other sports to get my education. So I had nothing to, nothing to lose. I was the unknown here. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I was back in my happy place, like I was as a little girl on a golf course. All I needed to do was focus in the present moment. I didn't worry about what happened before or ahead of me. It was at the moment. It was me playing in course and no one else. Amazingly, I put four consecutive rounds of golf together that week as a stranger from Williamsport, Maryland. And I made the cut. The rest was history. So as I joined the tour, my schedule consisted of 30 to 32 consecutive weeks of solid competition and traveled the entire country, met people from all over, all walks of life. I saw a lot of beautiful golf courses, lots of tour housing, hotels, well-traveled back roads, small towns, communities, business and corporate sponsors, youth, nonprofit organizations, hospitals. Traveling is an education in itself. If you have not traveled, I encourage you to. There's so much out there and you will learn so much in traveling alone. It really opens up your eyes and allows you to see so many people, ideas, and different ways to accomplish the mission. Through the tour experience, I had learned that I had an entrepreneurial spirit within me. And um, I absolutely loved interacting and working with the people in the community wherever I tour stopped that week. Once I retired from golf in 2004, I received my first cochlear implant in 2005. And again in 2016 for my other ear. Wow. Look out guys, I can not only see what you're saying, but now I can hear everything you're saying. <laughs> this was the game changer for me. Um, it was amazing. And, uh, I tell you, you know what, you know, I got to tell you, the other beautiful thing is I can still turn it off when I want to. <laughs> so, um, since we receiving the cochlear implants, I have grown intellectually, I've expanded my knowledge, and I continue to maximize my fullest potential. Um, in a way, I received a new life with a new skill set. I could finally talk clear and not have to repeat myself. People were understanding me again. Um, I could use the telephone now. Oh, wow, this is cool. So now um, I'm able to expand and network and talk to people. This really helped me develop leadership skills from being a team player to now an entrepreneur. Um, I was a very versatile athlete, and uh, now I consider myself a very versatile entrepreneur who is not afraid to take risks. I'm not afraid of failing or making mistakes. For all of the highs and lows I've been through in my life, you become stronger and stronger. Over the years, I've gained full trust in God and truly believed he had a better plan. When things do not go as you had planned, I have learned to understand it will all work itself out. It does. It works itself out every time. When you believe that, everything always works out. Once you learn to figure this out, you will no longer have doubt and worry. I know everybody in here worries a little bit, and you doubt a little bit. And that's normal, but I'm telling you, the stronger you get with your faith, that goes away. You can simply achieve anything you strive for. There's no holding back. You will be free. So seven years ago, I was in a position to return to my roots right here in Washington County, Wimpsport. I bought back my family farm where I'm fifth generation. Many people doubted me and thought I was crazy again. They're like, who is going to come to Williamsport and say and visit 
a bed and breakfast there. No one. That's all I heard. Well, I've done my research and uh, found the tourism history, the number of the parks in the area, and the preservation of farms. And I'm like, wow, this is perfect. So I took the risk and the journey to restore the farm to become a bed and breakfast and to create a venue for the community. So my farm is Elmwood Farm, bed and breakfast. I encourage you to come by and visit. My sister, Letty, has joined me in the business and she's done a phenomenal job. So I gotta thank her for being a part of my adventure. We have expanded with a gift shop specializing in alpaca fleece clothing from our 14 alpacas. We are in the process of starting a distillery this summer. In another perspective, I saw the need and potential to help the town of Williamsport revitalize itself to become a happy, vibrant river canal town to support the local community and tourism off the CNO Canal and other parks. I am proud to have four great business women join me at Port 44 on this exciting and challenging real estate venture to work on creating a positive spirit, a better quality place to live and to do business, yet making Williamsport a place you want to visit and stay. I will tell you, you must take risks and face all of the pushbacks and handle controversy head on. I know a lot of people say, oh, I don't like controversy. We just want to back up and crawl in a hole and hide. Well, folks, we have to face it. So you might as well make up your mind right now. I've got this. We're going to do this and be fair. It only makes you grow and better. I have been a risk taker all my life, and that's exactly why I'm here today. And you bet, I'm not done. There's a lot more to do. Please continue to be or become the gritty person who never gives up. You know your own capabilities, strengths, and weaknesses. Your strong character and self-esteem are important to be persistent. Learn from your failures. Continue to work towards success, and you will win. You will. Whether you realize it or not, if you already know how to accept, adapt, and adjust to overcome major challenges with confidence, then you're well on your way to lead others in your generation to accomplish major milestones. I encourage you to hold yourself accountable with a personal mission statement. Think about that for a second. Do you have a personal mission statement? Do you have personal goals? Well, I encourage you to start today. It will make a difference. For instance, my personal mission statement, I aspire to be an inspiration through instinct, diligence, and inner strength, leading a God-centered life around the principles of integrity, empathy, excellence, service to others, and trustworthiness. I will create added value in everything I do with courage, compassion, and curiosity. I will live a life with gratitude, always mindful of the things I'm given and grateful for them. I aim to be fearless, resilient in myself. I seek to inspire others to reach their fullest potential and seek opportunities to share my knowledge, to grow my own entrepreneurial ideas and share the amazing journey with the community. I will always be grateful and remember, my life is blessed. One last thing to all of you. Always forgive to move on with believing, persevering, and making all the positive difference to be free. I want to thank you all very much for having me here. Thank you.
Christine, you come in. Thank you so much. Do, uh, do we have any questions for Selena? Yeah. yeah. So what time does, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> what time does your bed and breakfast open and close throughout the week? Oh my goodness. It is open all year round. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> you uh, can book online through our website, Emworth Farm B&B, &B, or you can call. We are pretty busy, so I encourage you to book now for, for a couple months out. Oh, yeah. But I guarantee you, have a great time. Yeah. Any other question? Do you have a favorite golf course you've been to? Oh, man, there's so many of them. But I'm going to be honest with you, I play some great courses. So uh, uh, Black Wolf Run, Coldwell, Wisconsin, U.S. Open Qualifier for me. But I got to be honest with you, you know what my favorite course really is? It's Black Rock Golf Course right here in Washington County. <laughs> I love it. That's where I started and that's where I play today. Nice. Sure. Oh. Uh, one more, one more question. On one Same person. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. Do you happen to have an online store for your alpaca sweatshirts? You know, uh, yes and no. Darn At it. the moment, no. But we are currently getting that site put up. Perfect. Okay, so I encourage you now to just come visit. We're open every day by appointment for that, but we will have an online store. Okay. We'll get, we'll get back to you. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to say that, of course, you're really inspiring, and I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people today. And I'm, you reminded me of a quote I saw a while ago that said, um, you never become, you don't become a failure until you're satisfied with being one. That's right. Absolutely. That's why I, Thank you. I encourage you to go after your dream. You will fall, you will fail, but that's why I said keep trying again, again, again. It will work out. You'll grow and learn from those mistakes and then finally accomplish your goal. Yeah. Any other questions? I know we have one up here, Professor Durham Gould. We have a person okay. up here. Yes. I think we've got time for one more and we can move on to the hedge app event. Who was, who's the one more? Yes, sir. Um, when you were playing golf, do you remember any people that gave you the best time, like played against anyone who gave you a very best time while playing golf? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch all of that. Who gave you the best time when you were playing golf? So when I was playing golf on tour, believe it or not, I was on tour with Lorena Ochoa. And coincidentally, she's being inducted in the World Golf Hall of Fame. And she was a wonderful person. She's actually from Mexico. And uh, we, we were on a futures tour together. And very, um, very positive. She always lifted up everyone around her. And, um, but I play with a lot of great people, but I, she's my go-to that comes to mind. Any other questions? Okay. All right, well, thank, thank you, you again Selena. Very much. Selena will be around to answer questions afterwards as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Selena, for your inspiring words. I know I was very moved by your talk today. Uh, next up, we have Professor Amanda Miller. Um, Amanda is a professor of the English department and the faculty advisor for HCC's Hedge Apple magazine. Please join me in welcoming Amanda. Thank you. Uh, that was such a good speech. I do feel inspired. And I also feel really honored to have collected so many essays from you guys. We had about 40 entries and um, it was wonderful because the, the voices were so diverse. So reading one after another, I really got this feeling that we might have different circumstances, but we're all kind of on the same journey. Um, and some of them were funny and some of them were sad and some of them were 
heartfelt and inspirational and um, just very distinct. So it was wonderful to collect them, but I am also so glad that I didn't have to do the judging. We actually sent them to three. We had three judges who judged them blind. So the three judges were Alex Gibson, who is our English club president, um, Dixie Myers, who is president or um, professor emeritus, and then Gary Mullen, who is doctor of philosophy at Gettysburg College, and also my husband. He's on sabbatical, so he was sitting around, and I was like, hey, read these things. Um, so, um, we have some honorable mentions that I would like to go ahead and um, ask you to stand. I'm going to read all six of them, and I know a lot of you guys are here, and then we can applaud for you. So, those honorable mentions are Maggie Possinger, Michelle Bupp, Eric Schwartz, Eileen Stein, Hayden Beatty, and Jessica Sidler. So. Hey, congratulations. So these guys will be published in the Hedge Apple along with the finalists. Um, the print version will be coming out in June. And then today we're going to hear from four finalists. And just to tell you that the judges were told to pick the essays with the most powerful message and the writing style that communicated that message the best. So the first up is our third runner up, Rachel Babylon with Little Blessings of a Bitter Curse. Hello. I didn't realize I was going first, so here we are. I believe infertility is a blessing and a curse. Hearing this may widen eyes and raise eyebrows. After all, infertility is the taboo topic of the baby-making world. Oftentimes, when people hear the word infertility, they automatically become uncomfortable. They shut down, change the subject, look away, or assure the speaker, most likely the one with infertility, that they do not truly embody that word. I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, 11 years ago. I was young, naive, and 15, and all I understood was that although PCOS was common and overall manageable, the biggest obstacle was the potential of infertility. There were warning signs I'd hoped would resolve themselves. Missed or late cycles, uh, periods that lasted for over 60 days, and bleeding that wouldn't stop until I was in the ER. When they didn't, I fearfully waited for the confirmation. I had fertility issues due to anovulation. My husband was aware of my diagnosis, the extra steps it might involve, the heartbreak it would inevitably cause, the uncertainties of the outcome in our journey. Yet no one around us seems to accept it. They're horrified every time as if uttering the reality of our quiet battle will somehow make my infertility worse. Perhaps, if we didn't mention it, our struggle simply wouldn't exist. That's how curses work, right? Karma or God has spited me for bearing and verbalizing my infertility and made it so. I've cursed myself. But over these long, tiring past two years of trying to get pregnant, I've realized that I still have small yet significant blessings that those with children no longer possess. I can noisily stumble out of bed at midnight to indulge in fast food cravings anytime I want. I can organize relaxing vacations without worrying about childcare or family friendly requirements. I can come home from a grueling day of work and my duties are done. I can even nap without fear of a child demanding my attention. <laughs> These tiny blessings are the little bits of joy I will cherish for now, though I hope one day they will only be memories. So while we strive for a miracle, I've devoted myself to another passion, writing. I focus on writing in between taking multiple shots in my stomach, having my blood drawn repeatedly, a wander speculum shoved up between my legs, swallowing pill after pill, and sobbing over insurance, all for the sake of attempting to create a minuscule human atom. I realize that without experiencing infertility, I wouldn't be fortunate enough to tell others the labor of it. I would not be able to clutch the hands and hearts of other men and women who are silently and agonizingly going through the same fight. I believe if we do not speak of infertility, it will remain a raw burden that many of our brothers and sisters will suffer from in isolation, and they will not accept the hidden blessings that come with curses. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and congratulations. Our second runner-up is David Buckwalter with It's Just Some Plastic.
it's hard to follow follow that Rachel with uh, an essay about plastic, but uh, here I go. I stared down at the small plastic wrapper in the quiet parking lot. It was freezing, and I just wanted to get in my car, but for some reason I couldn't. I knew in a flash that the wind could come and take away the wrapper before my eyes, never to be seen again. But it certainly would have been thought of again. In that instant, a thousand scenarios flashed through my mind. Maybe this tiny wrapper flies away to the ocean, contributing to the ever-growing mound of trash that destroys the sea life. Or maybe it would blow into someone's yard, ruining their perfectly green landscape they worked hard to maintain. Perhaps it would not blow away at all, but rather sit in the parking lot for eternity, forever a reminder that some young man refused to pick up this trash. Many people wouldn't think twice about such a small wrapper, but I didn't want to be like those people. People who would take a shortcut for their convenience while disregarding such major consequences that they would never deal with. In that moment, however, I was tempted to be that person. It's just a wrapper after all, right? It won't actually cause any harm. The cold air told me these things while my mind fought back. Is this who I am? Someone who can see the disaster a mile away and yet just walk away? I'm supposed to be someone good, someone who cares about the earth and the people around me. I want to fix the problems of the world, certainly not make them. I couldn't possibly live with myself knowing that I ignored such a big deal, even if it wasn't my wrapper. It reveals a lot about someone who casually can walk past some trash without feeling at least a little guilt. I made my decision. I braved the cold and walked over towards the little piece of plastic. I knelt down, picked it up, went over to the nearest trash can, and tossed away the potential guilt. Sure, it was only a tiny wrapper, but all the issues in the world once started out that size. I believe that the only way to fix these problems and make the world a better place is by taking small steps over and over. Thanks, David. And now we have our first runner-up, Mike Harsh, with My Earliest Motivation. Wow. Selena. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Selena, there is definitely something going on in Williamsport. Um, we did not talk to each other about what we were going to write about. And um, there's a great, and this is for my humanities students, synthesis here. Uh, this, I believe, my earliest motivation. The experience that I recall from my days as a mackerel snapping, booger picking, bead counting Catholic school kid. The legacy of my Catholic education was probably what led me to teaching as a profession in the first place. I've always been the kind of person who is determined to show people who make judgments about my abilities just how wrong they are. So my desire to become a teacher grew from my earliest experience in first grade. It was there that I was a victim of the most notorious members of the School Sisters of Notre Dame ever to strap on a rosary. Sister Mary Iguana Breath. <laughs> now I doubt that that was really her professed name, but it certainly described, for my memories, one of her outstanding personal characteristics. Now her physical dimensions were better suited to professional wrestling than to teaching, she must have topped the scales at about 350 pounds of righteous flesh, wrapped in 10 yards of heavy black cotton fabric, and sealed with reams of starched white sailcloth. Sister Iguana Breath decided from the first day we met that I was not the ideal student. Now, of course, the fact that I yanked one of my classmates' pigtails so hard from behind that she cried and wet her pants had nothing to do with that. Clearly, she concluded, I was a troublemaker from Williamsport and needed severe correction, repeated correction. Our class was arranged in ability groups for students and subjects, especially reading and math. The front of the room, where you guys are, 
They were the uh, bluebirds, robins, you know, the real brown nosers. <laughs> Next in the middle of the room, there were cardinals, blue jays, students that were not her favorites, but still in her mind, trainable. Then came my group. We were in the back. Actually, it was two of us, Cletus and me. We were the starlings, but the rest of the class called us the bird shit group. <laughs> Classy students, we little Catholics. Sister had determined that we were not teachable and that all she could do was discipline us in preparation for our future careers in reform school and a state prison. That's all the motivation Cleet and I needed. We were determined to prove her wrong. What's well, now 65 years later? Cleet owns an entire city block of Philadelphia and runs the leading toxic waste disposal business in Pennsylvania. He has also donated a scholarship in the name of Sister Mary Zubreth to Loyola College. Me? After finishing a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and almost all of a doctorate, I will soon celebrate my 45th year in teaching other eagles and robins and cardinals and, yeah, more than a few bird shitters, how to achieve academic success. It is truly a profession I would have never entered if Sister had not developed so strong a negative opinion of my lack of academic prowess. Bless your, uh, bless your pungent vapor, sister. <laughs> I would have never made it without you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, and now we have the contest winner, who is Mina Fouch with My Grief is Balanced on Analog Hands. I'm nervous. All right. <laughs> okay. So this is titled, My Grief is Balanced on Analog Hands. My brother had an illness that flooded his adolescent body. His blood had morphed into bad blood, too young to know the problem only that his bruises were amplifying in shades of chartreuse and hues of blue. He was the kind of sick that made my mom start praying to a God she didn't believe in. The kind of sick that gripped my dad, of muscle and liquor and a proud poker face by the throat, to make a loud man start crying. I do not remember these years I lived through. I live in a haunted house. It is full of pictures of us in different hospital rooms and him, our baby boy, blowing out birthday candles. The ghosts in this room making wishes on an exhale of breath over mushy icing. The bones of this house are molded by the nights I've spent staring at corners. Time is the blood that runs through these walls. It is the heartbeat that thumps as if to say, remember, remember, remember. And sometimes it comes to me in dreams. This trauma is the spoon that slowly digs itself into my core. A slow death, a gravitational pull. I get these memories in butterfly flutters, our parents out and I, the easy babysitter. The way, as soon as they left, he filled an entire cup with his own blood, this haunting nosebleed. The way my mind reluctantly owns this moment as if it's asking me to relive the terror of being alone in a house with walls that seem to close in on us, with a brother who is sick and a mind that is not yet ready to process the feeling of grief. An ambiguous loss of our childhood. He who is seen as the kid with cancer and I, the older sister, this supposed growing young woman who is so strong to have endured such tragedy. But I, the imposter, the girl who puts on a facade in order to comfort her brother who is bleeding fast and without end, 
who is praying to someone somewhere for her mom to come home soon to fix the uncomfortable, never-ending drip of cancer, forever calling to her parents as if they have the power to stop this sickness from infecting our laughter. Time does not stop for our sadness. I have forgotten how to exhale without making wishes, and I know nothing of running from tragedy. I live inside of loss and make myself a bed for grief as if to say, welcome home. Please take some time to be. Thank you. Wow, I think I need a minute there. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mina. Um, thank you, Selena. Thank you, everybody who's read today. And thank you, everyone, for making our very first campus book event a success. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back next year. And um, go HCC. Thank you all for being awesome. You've been wonderful today. Thank you. Yes, um, can we please have the contest winners uh, come up for a photo, and S Selena as well, and yes, all of our speakers today, if you'd please come up for a photo. Uh, for everyone else, cookies and punch. So.